All right. So the topic today is a community detection. We actually already started talking about it. Well, we've been talking about it for a while. Uh, we interrupted to talk uh, a bit about um, you know coronavirus, and then we spent some time um, you know discussing uh, a very particular approach to community detection through graph partitioning. So now we'll continue today. It's more of a review of different methods. So you would know, um, you know, if you need to do community detection, um, you know, what method to use. So um, we're going to talk about, well, actually in a different order, but we're going to talk about overlapping communities. We're going to talk about the task community, community unfolding methods. We're going to talk about walk trap and a couple more approaches. So first of all, community detection. Um, we typically, or I mean, so far, we mostly looked um, at the approaches, and we only looked actually at the approaches um, that are shown here on, on the left, right? So, so this is um, the way we thought about graphs so far. And when we looked into community detection, we thought about mostly about um, the graph partitioning approaches. So where you can, for example, cut out a bunch of, of no of edges, right? And that will um, split graph into communities. Now that approach will not work here. And, and the reason is there is this node D right here that pretty much sits on the overlap of two tight communities. Now, if we use our traditional methods, we'll probably find this no, these edges and we'll be able to split the yellow uh, versus the rest but our traditional methods that looking into edge detection or I mean into community detection through uh, partitioning will not be able to handle this because um, you know to detect this partitioning uh, you know there is quite a few edges that need to be cut and in fact these are sort of quite natural overlapping communities and we'll see where when it's happening but for example think about the situation um, you know even with your Facebook friends you probably have a group of friends who are, uh, you know, from your from you know, your hometown, from your childhood, and then there is university friends, and then maybe there are work friends, and you might as well your hobby friends, and uh, you might very well be the only one person that's sort of on overlap of those of those different communities, and so um, that would uh, sort of mean that you know we either need to cut you out of, this, of one of those communities, or communities should be overlapping. Right in this sense, overlapping communities is a much more flexible uh, scenario. But what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about um, approaches, both approaches to you know to this type of partitioning and then to that. Now, um, telling the truth, the most efficient ways, of course, is here, right, to partition graphs, and that's where the most of the algorithms are, and that's what most of the people are doing anyway. Um, but uh, you know what we see on the right is especially important when you know, maybe you don't have a huge graph, but uh, you need to be very precise in, term of, in terms of uh, membership of different nodes to different communities. All right, so moving on. Um, just want to remind you the metric that we have previously discussed, um, the metric of modularity. And um, you know that's the, the the metric that has been proposed by uh, Newman, and the idea was that you calculate this measure right here. You sum up, go over all uh, nodes in the graph. You calculate this uh, difference, and the difference is AIJ's adjacency matrix and KIKJ divided by two M. This is just a node degree, the degree of node i, degree of node j, but it has a meaning of expected um, you know, value there for, for if, if the graph was random. And uh, the way the sum works, um, this, this difference contributes to the sum only if both nodes i and j belongs to the same community, belongs to the same cluster, right? So in fact, um, this sum just takes into account the edges uh, for the nodes that belong to the same cluster, right? Now, this modularity is a metric for the graph or for the, for the graph partitioning into or for, for you know, the best um, sort of 
community structure, right, distribution in the graph. So you might have multiple, you have multiple communities, but this is a single metric and this metric is computed for the entire graph. All right. Now you might have different um, combination, different sort of distribution, different partitioning um, into the communities. Um, and for each of those partitions, you can calculate this modularity. And uh, uh, the, the idea, the hypothesis is that um, for any given network, the partition with maximal modularity corresponds to the best or optimal community structure for this graph. Now, this is not a theorem. This is not, a, it's, it's just a hypothesis. And that hypothesis has been verified, you know, many, many times on different graphs. It's actually, you know, there, there are some, of course, examples where it doesn't work too well. Um, and, you know, there are, there are a lot of papers showing that it might be not sensitive to small communities. But in general, people tend to accept this as a good um, criterion. And so there are, when, you, when we build now um, algorithms, there are really sort of two approaches, right? One approach would be to optimize something, right? For example, when we did the graph partitioning, we, you know, we, we looked at the cut, value of the cut, or maybe you, you're gonna do agglomerative stuff where you just, you will sort of locally do things um, based on some graph properties, but you monitor modularity, right? You just see how it changes. And then eventually, you know, you, you decide, okay, you know, this is a good enough value. You know, I, I stop, I'm done, here is my, um, here, here is my communities. Another way of doing this would be to actually take modularity metric and optimize modularity on every step, right, of, of the algorithm. So again, modularity can be used as a sort of checking uh, of, of, of the way, you know, to check the solution. And that's what we've done previously when we talked about uh, Fiedler vectors and, uh, you know, partitioning of the graph, or it can, can be used as optimization criterion where you, you literally trying to, uh, you know, maximize it. Right. Another thing to remember that we want the largest. So it is a maximization problem. Okay. So um, moving forward. Now we're going to talk about um, this method, which is what's called a spectral modularity maximization. Um, in fact, um, this is a method that, that Mark Newman proposed and it's pretty much taking um, that graph partitioning algorithm that we discussed previously, right? The second eigenvector, Fiddler vector type of approach, spectral graph partitioning, taking that and you know, modifying it a bit to instead through the, through the computation of eigenvalues and eigenvectors to maximize modularity. So this is how it's done. Um, we look uh, again at bipart you know, bipartitioning right now, right? We're, we're gonna split, split the graph into two pieces. Um, and then you know, eventually we can um, you know, do this hierarchical story, um, doing you know, split, divide and conquer. But let's say, let's start with two classes, uh, class one and class two, and again, indicator variable, pretty much the same way as we previously done. Um, but I, you, you, we're gonna write it slightly differently. Um, yeah, but the meaning is exactly the same, right? So we have delta CI, CJ um, is going to be one half of the product CI, CJ plus one. Now notice if SI and SJ, they both uh, either plus one or minus one, this expression is equal to one. And if any of SI or SJs are of opposite sign, this expression is zero. And so that means that, uh, you know, it, it, it means this expression on the right works exactly the way as we want it, which is it gives us um, plus one, uh, it gives us one if nodes i and j have the same label and belongs to the same class and gives us zero otherwise. So we can take that and put it into the modularity formula, right? Just plug it in. And all of a sudden, uh, you notice, you know, doing some simple um, manipulations, you notice that modularity is now a quadratic form 
with respect to this SI as J indicator variable. Um, and the matrix here, matrix here now is what's called BIJ. And that is a form of the matrix. So um, it is, you know, again, very, very similar to what we have done with spectral graph partitioning, except for now the matrix is not Laplacian, but this matrix <clears throat> BIJ. All right. Okay. So then um, moving along. Here's a quadratic form. Um, it's an integer optimization. Um, then it's exactly following the same scenario as we done previously, where we do relaxation instead of integers, we go to real values. Uh, we again try to keep the norm and we're gonna have a, a quadratic optimization. But now what we're looking for is a maximum, right? Last time it was again Laplace and minimum. Now it's a different matrix and it's maximization problem. So that means when you look at eigenvector solution, you're gonna look for the maximum eigenva eigenvalue and the corresponding eigenvector, all right? Exactly the same, the, the rest is exactly the same as we've done before. So the algorithm, you know, we take adjacency matrix, we introduce this class indicator vector. We compute, um, you know, no degrees for the matrix. We build um, this matrix B. And then uh, we solve a maximum eigenvector. Do maximum, uh, you know, solve eigenvector eigenvalue, solve a maximum eigenvector. And then uh, compute or go back to indicator as, uh, you know, sign of, of the elements of the vector, right? So it's again, exactly following what has been done uh, previously. All right, so let's see what it looks like in example. This is the same uh, um, karate algorithm, I mean, you know, karate club graph. And here um, I computed the values. Uh, this is the largest eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue, right? And for each vertex, and there are, I believe what, 34 of those, um, in the graph, uh, for each of them, there is a corresponding, you know, value within eigenvector, right? And so then, according to the algorithm, what we need to do is we just should say, okay, well, here is this line, and all the nodes that are below will belong to one class, and these all nodes will belong to another class, all right? So that's, that's, pretty much, you know, what we are, uh, you know, what, what the algorithm says. Now, uh, and if we actually, you know, look at the results, we'll see that it works. Now, what you can also do is, is quite interesting. You can also do, um, you can also try to permute vertices, right? The same way also as we did in, um, in, 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 a, in a previous, in, um, in a previous approach with Laplacians, right? We can also permute vertices and order them by the increasing value of the second eigen, uh, of the, by the increasing value of, of the node within the second eigenvector. So literally I, I can sort this, right? So, you know, I can, I can permute the vertices such a way that I'll can get sort of growing, uh, slowly growing numbers, right? And then what I can do is for, now I have ordered, I have ordered the nodes. And what I can do after that, I can try to partition them into two parts by separating, say the first node versus, 30, what, versus the rest 33, or first and second node versus the rest 32, or first and third versus the rest 35, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, we can actually renumber and arrange the nodes. And then I can um, try to do, you know, to, to have a partition here or to have a partition 
here, or I have a partition here, and I have a partition here. If I partition it right here, this is a node that will go to the, to the one partition, this is a node going to another partition. So what I'm saying is, instead of just looking for all possible combination of nodes, by doing this, computing this eigenvalue, an eigenvector, I projected all the nodes into one dimensional space. And I assigned each of them coordinate that corresponds to um, the, the value within the eigenvector. And then I can rank them by that. And then I can look for splitting of the graph by cutting it in, in, in different places. All right, let me explain why I'm talking about this. Um, so first of all, if I just do this split, you know, the way the algorithm tells me, uh, and the algorithm tells me that this is gonna be the best one, um, what I can do is then see that, right? You know, we have seen many times that lots of algorithm works pretty well on a, this on the Karate Club, and this one also, you know, did a pretty good job. So we're not surprised, uh, but that's sort of what we get from the from the algorithm. Now, what's interesting is if I do what I just have described, this procedure of taking all the nodes and ordering them, right, by increasing uh, value or, or by, by increasing, you know, value within the eigenvector, and then I do cut it, I do slide, I do cut it in between the first node and the second node, um, cut it in between, you know, first node and the second node and compute the modularity, right? So this value corresponds me cutting my graph in between second node, in between first node and second node. And this first and second nodes, these are renumbered nodes, which means um, these are now, they are numbered, uh, they're ordered with increasing um, value of, of the eigenvalue, right? And so if I cut, if I, if I cut, if I split the graph into one single node and the rest, that's what the modularity is gonna be for that partitioning. If I split it here, well, that's what the modularity is gonna be from the partitioning. If I split it here, that's what the modularity is gonna be for the partition. So what I'm saying is uh, by doing this type of projection and later on, later on giving the swipe, I can actually, at least within this one dimensional ordering, I can get the optimal partitioning. Well, and in fact, here it is, you know, it looks very much, uh, you know, balanced partition, balanced cut. It's, you know, the same as the original algorithm gave us. But sometimes, um, you know, the, this, this maxima can be actually shifted. And so that's sort of another way to, you know, convince yourself that at least within, within this one dimensional embedding that, algorithm allowed you to do. You selecting the optimal cut into those two groups. Now, does this make sense? Sort of? Can okay. I ask? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, can we obtain the more than one uh, maximal, local maximum of modularity? Ooh, can we be more than, I mean, you can probably have, you know, you could potentially have, you know, those kind of situations, right? I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you get, if you get things like that. Um, uh, you know, can you get sort of, um, you know, the same, uh, the same height? I don't know. Um, maybe, I, I mean, I don't see why not. So look, what we've done is the following. Um, imagine that you have, so we have this graph, right? And we want to partition into two uh, parts. So there are, you know, factorially large number of ways we can split this graph into, you know, groups of, into the two groups, right? Because the group size can be different and we calculated that previously, right? It's n factorial divided by n, one factorial divided by n, two factorial, right? So we cannot just go through all of them. Um, so the idea here is let's try to find some, and, and this is sort of different look at this, but it's, you know, you can also interpret this for both 
you know, spectral in this algorithm. What we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to find a projection of that network onto low dimensional space, and in particular, into one dimensional space. So which means we're trying to assign coordinates to each node along a line, right? So if you want to embed the graph in 2D, you'll have to assign two coordinates to every node. If you want to embed in 1D, you know, you just assign one coordinate. Now, the claim for um, the Laplacian method is that those nodes that are very tightly connected, they will, be, they will get numbers, they'll be ordered such a way that, um, you know, the, the, that the nodes that are tightly connected will get the consecutive numbers, almost consecutive numbers. So um, the, 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 the distance in between them will be short, right? There will be all kind of try to squish them next to each other. Now, this algorithm does something different. It actually also embeds in 1D, but it doesn't look at the particular distance in between each and every node. It actually looks at optimizing this sort of modularity metric. So it kind of distributes the nodes such a way that maximizes that thing. And that's what I'm saying is very simply, after you embed it into 1D and the nodes somehow you know, sitting in this 1D, you need still to do the, you know, split it into clusters, you still need to partition it somehow. And what I'm saying is, you know, we can partition it sort of at the very beginning of this axis a little bit further, 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 right? And depending on where I do this, I'm gonna get sort of, you know, different modularity. And, you know, possibly one of those partitioning will give us the best modularity score, and that's what we select. Now, um, the, the algorithm and sort of the theory claims that the best, um, you know, in the perfect world would be, um, you know, at, at, at the zero crossing, right? But as you, as you remember from discussion last time, you know, this sort of zero line is, is our, you know, we're making a sort of leap of faith there when we're doing it, especially since, uh, you know, we are going from discrete to, continuous optimization. Um, so there is sort of no um, deep math in, in here that would tell us that it should be particularly zero, right? Okay, all right, now that method actually works. Uh, it works nicely here. Now the challenge for that method is that, um, you know, eigenvalue, 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 eigenvector problem, you know, is not very easy to do, right? I mean, you know, you can still, there, there, there is what's called like Lansash algorithm. There is a power iterations that allows you to compute um, the largest eigenvalue eigenvector. And, you know, that's where it can, it can work. But if you want to embed it onto more, um, you know, eigenvalues, um, that's going to be challenging. And in general, you know, computing eigenvalues eigenvectors on a graph of million nodes is hard. So here's a different algorithm. Now, this algorithm um, monitors modularity and tries to optimize it, but it doesn't do it um, in this sort of mathematically consistent way. Uh, instead, what it does, it just, um, you know, use some heuristic, something empirical, something, you know, guys thought might work, and use it, you know, and, and gets, uh, you know, some results, which happens to work really well. Now, in fact, this algorithm, um, you know, it's probably, you know, an algorithm of choice right now, in spite of the fact that it is like, you know, 10, year, 10 years old. Now, um, there are two components of this algorithm. First, it's, it is this multi-resolution approach, and that's what makes it really fast. And second, it does optimize modularity, but it does it in sort of local way, right? So it doesn't do this, doesn't do this sort of global optimization, uh, but it tries by construction to, you know, reach the largest value, all right? So let's see how it works. Um, and, and by the way, this is an example of that, that they presented when published that algorithm. Um, in, in 2008, this is uh, graph partitioning or community detection on 2 million mobile phone network. Um, and I think it's, it's called Luvian 
method because um, the, the authors um, that's, uh, that belong to the University of Louvain, um, it's in Belgium. And I think, uh, I, I might be wrong, but I think the story behind the picture is that uh, you know, in Belgium, so you have several languages people speak, obviously a French, and I think, you know, the, the pretty big population, um, you know, the German speaking there, um, or maybe, uh, no, I don't want to lie, but anyway, there are, there are several sort of big parts of population speaking different languages, and this is a phone call network, right, so where, where people make uh, places calls, and obviously, you know, the, the same language speakers will speak to the same, you know, language speakers most of the time. And so the, what, what they wanted to do is to see if they can detect um, those, you know, large communities. Um, and um, that sort of, that worked for them. All right, so what's the algorithm? Um, it's, again, it's heuristic. And, um, you know, because it's, it's heuristic, it means, and it's also, you know, greedy optimization. Greedy means, you know, it doesn't guarantee you find global, uh, you know, optima. It just tells you that, look, you know, we're going to move towards, you know, optima and let's see what happens, right? Um, it's multi-resolution scheme, so it's it kind of hierarchical. And uh, because of that, it's very scalable. So again, this is the same, it's the same modularity, but now we're not trying to, you know, explicitly solve optimization problem, we're gonna do this greedy modularity optimization. So here's an algorithm. I first gonna sort of talk through this and, and then I'm gonna show you example on, uh, you know, on, on, a, on a picture. Dutch, ah, Flemish, exactly. Okay, yep, there you go. So it's, uh, it's Flemish and, and French, right? By the way, guys, you know, you have microphones, feel free to jump in. And, uh, and I still, you know, how many people we have? We have 20 people, we have six cameras. Come on, don't be shy. Okay, so, so here's the algorithm. Um, consists of two phases. First phase, we, you know, we assign every node to its own community, right? Oh, and by the way, since this is, you know, empirical sort of heuristic algorithm, you literally don't ask why you do it exactly that way and not other way around. It's just because the authors tried it and it worked, right? Um, so you assign every node to its own community. And then you calculate the modularity for the graph, right? Where every node is assigned to its own community. So there'll be as many communities as, um, nodes in the graph, of course, modularity in this case will be very, very low. Now, we're gonna go node by node, and for every node, look what's gonna be happening, what, look what's gonna happen if we place that node into the community of its neighbor, right? So there is a node, it has some neighbors, so we say, okay, look, uh, what if, uh, this node belongs to the same community as its neighbor, all right? So we, we place it into that community. We calculate the modularity. If it is increases, we keep it that way. If it does not, we do nothing, right? And so you check it with all the nodes. If then you, you, you assign it to the one that uh, uh, give the largest increase of the modularity. And if none of them increase the modularity, you don't do anything, all right? And then you just do it with all the nodes. In fact, authors claim that uh, it works the best when you even run multiple sort of loops through this. So you do it with first node, second, third, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're done through all the nodes, then you come back to the first node and try it again because the structure might have changed already, right? Now, it's very obvious from this description that the result will depend on which node you start, right? And will depend on, we, on, on how you kind of go through this. Um, and that's why this algorithm, I mean, one of the ways to make it robust is to just run it multiple times with different seed nodes. Okay, so you do this iterations, right? And after a while, you notice that um, 
you cannot increase you know modularity anymore so which means you like reach the local maximum of the modularity then what you do you do this uh, multi-resolution schema where you those nodes that are now have the labels of the same community you merge them into one node called that it's a super node add weights um, on edges and then just repeat and you just do this until you're done because now what you're doing on every iteration you're combining it in based on modularity then you're merging them then you're again iterating on this you know larger scale then you're merging on the larger scale and larger and eventually you will get to the point where it's all sort of merged into one super node so here is what it looks like right so you start at first assigning all the nodes to all the different communities um, every node its own community then you start going node by node and saying okay node zero does it you know if i if i merge node zero and put the node zero and to the same community as node three will this increase modularity or not if i put it in the same community with node five will it increase modularity if i put it in the same community with node two will it increase the modularity all right then you know let's say with node two it increases modularity all right i assign them to the same community then let's go to the next node and etc 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 and so after you do this after a while you will get this picture so these guys belong to one community this is another community this is to the third to the fourth and then you know even if you continue doing this continue like asking for each node if it's going to increase the modularity you know you, you realize that if i take this node and assign to the community of the node 11 it's not going to increase the modularity all right so after it kind of saturated and it does not this this reassignment does not increase modularity you take those nodes that uh belongs to the same classes now and merge them into you know single super nodes you got this this picture right and then you you know what changes is every super node get got weight which is based on the number of nodes that that is in there and the edges are you just add up how many edges connects you know those classes right that's the weight and then you do the same again and again and again and again until you pretty much end up with you know very very um, you know small network right does it make sense how we use uh, weight of uh, links uh, during the algorithm yes um i don't remember right now uh you know how it's actually being used um it's prop oh it, it's okay here's how it's being used um there is probably a reweighting um let me get back You know, this is a good question um there is probably because every time you change modularity right when you do this combination i suspect um so you get new matrix right it's aj is initial matrix but then you get a matrix for uh you know new graph right for this super node graph which is which will be much smaller than ij because now it's going to be matrix of the super nodes and then um it's going to carry um, you know, the weights in there. I have a question. Uh, how do we consider, do we consider changes when we, which we already made on this step? So for example, uh, we have that placing node one in the, with node two in the same community increases modularity. And then we check, uh, is placing node two into node three community increases modularity or do we consider placing node one and node two because they are kind of in the same community right now together in the community with three um let me see i think i think and this is something um you know it's probably it's probably worth looking into the algorithm right to, to, you know the, the, and i refer in the paper um i think there still go over every single node so on the on this sort of first iteration level they check per node but what what might be happening is also um you know after you do the first kind of run through all the nodes 
you, you come back to sort of the first node, you, posit, you, you say, you, you, you kind of colored to the same community as say node two, and you again check it. If now, maybe now, recoloring it and grouping with community with node number three can actually increase modularity because three now is you know, grouped with somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. Remember, when you calculate modularity, you take, you, you, know, you count only the edges inside the community. So to answer your question, I, I think they're still doing it per node, uh, even after they, they you know, merge this to that. It's just single node trying to, to put single node in the community. But you know, double check with the paper. All right, and this is an example of some sort of beautiful visualization, right? Showing that this sort of multi-resolution scheme actually works. So, um, you know, th this algorithm is actually very, very simple. There is no proof that, you know, it will converge uh, to the optimal uh, modularity structure. There is no proof that it gives you the, you know, optimal modularity whatsoever, right? Like the same way, there is no proof that <laughs> There is no proof that modularity, the, the maximum modularity corresponds to the best partitioning. There is no proof that this approach will give you the maximum global modularity, but altogether, it actually gives you pretty good uh, partitioning into communities. You know, it's very similar again to the clustering problem when you have data, you, know, you don't know what optimal clustering is, but you sort of, when you get it, you kind of, okay, well, that, that, that makes sense. All right, different algorithms. And uh, as, I, as I said, we're going to talk today about a bunch of algorithms just to, to have a sort of overview of those things. Now, this one is um, also agglomerative, uh, also, I'm sorry, also hierarchical, but this time it's going to be agglomerative. So, um, you know, if you think the first, uh, the, the algorithm that we did, um, the um, Laplacian matrix, right, the spectral graph partitioning, that was a divisive algorithm, right? We kind of keep cutting it. Um, then, you know, the, the algorithm we started with today, um, with direct um, optimization of uh, modularity also was a, was a partitioning algorithm. Now, here, the previous one, this Blondell or, you know, Luvian algorithm, um, this is agglomerative, right? It wasn't sort of explicitly, yeah, I mean, it is explicitly agglomerative, you know, we're agglomerating things. Here, it's, uh, even more explicit in the sense it is like literally replicating of agglomerative clustering. So if you're familiar with agglomerative clustering, and I'm sure you are, um, you know, the only thing you need in order to run agglomerative clustering on, uh, on the data points is you need the metric, the similarity metric or the distance between those data points, right? When you have it, then there is like, multiple ways of doing it. Typically what you do is you just pick up, you go through all the pairs, right? You just select, um, you know, you, you select the, the, the closest distance, right? And then, you know, you merge them, right? Then you go through the rest, then you merge, you merge, you merge. Then you have like uh, groups of, you know, two nodes, and then you go through those two nodes groups um, and you calculate, you know, either, either largest or smallest or average distance in between nodes within those groups and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you build a hierarchy. So, you can do the same way uh, for, uh, you know, for, for graphs. And uh, this is a one of the way, you know, to do this, you need to introduce metrics of the node distance or, or, or you know, sort of similarity, if you wish, um, that allows you to merge nodes together. And so, for example, there in a paper like Ravash, um, uh, Ravash algorithm, you know, he introduced the following, measure of similarity. Now, again, this is pure heuristical algorithm. So um, you can actually just, for example, try to do clustering just using number of common neighbors, right? So, you know, the notion, the idea is kind of clear, right? You, you think if, you, if two nodes belong to the same cluster or to the same community, you expect that they have a lot of common friends. I mean, that's sort of the definition of community, right? You know, you, you have lots of friends in common. And so that means this number of common friends by itself can, you know, play a role of the similarity of the nodes that you can, you know, that will 
or distance between nodes, if you wish, um, the metric that will allow you to, to, to put them together. Uh, now, they proposed slightly different metric, which was, okay, there is a number of common neighbors in numerator, and then denominator uh, is normalized the minimum of, uh, you know, node degrees plus one minus theta, uh, and theta is a step function, which literally says, if the two nodes have a direct connection, then this is, uh, if they're directly connected, then, you know, one minus that thing is zero. And if they're not directly connected, it is, it is one, right? I actually don't know um, the logic, you know, why they, how they came up to this particular form. Um, check out their paper. It's probably explained why they do it, why they did it exactly that way. But in any case, if you try to, to build the similarity matrix, and this is a sample graph, you will see that, um, you know, for this sort of within those triangles, um, it gives you all ones, you know, all ones. Here it's also ones and two thirds, but, um, you know, those that shouldn't belong to the same community, they have a low weight here, right? Those, those scores on the edges are what scores? I think these are the scores. These are the scores. So it is, it is the scores that computed from similarity matrix. Um, and then if you take the similarity matrix, and exactly as in, uh, um, you know, agglomerative hierarchical clustering, run it, run it on, on the similarity matrix, that's what you're going to get, right? So you're going to get those sort of, it's, it will identify those as a clusters, right, as a groups. And so um, that's what, what you're going to get, right? So this is your three clusters, three blue, uh, four blue, four, you know, purple and green. All right, now. Mm -hmm. Sorry, may I ask? Yeah, yeah please. Uh, in hierarchical clustering, usually we firstly uh, merge with calculating distances between like points and then between clusters. And yeah. here, as far as I understand, we cal calculate always the distance between points. Um, no, no, no. What, what I was trying to say is uh, you do, you know, this is, I just showed you the first, first iteration. Um, uh, give me one sec. The algorithm itself is exactly hierarchical clustering, which is, so assign each node to its own community, right? And then evaluate those distances. Then, you know, find the, the, the node pairs with the highest similarity and merge into single communities, right? So then you go and merge to them. After that, you calculate similarity between the new communities, right, and other communities. And then you merge them again and you just keep doing it um, until you, you have a single community. And what's the similarity measure of between communities? Because it was between yeah. nodes. Yeah, I think, right? mm -hmm. I think they, uh, you, if you remember for, from hierarchical clustering, there is usually like what's called single linkage. I think, um, what, uh, what other metrics? Um, average single? linkage. Yeah, I, so, so they use average linkage. Um, I, I think there is a single linkage and then maximal linkage, I think, right? So they use average linkage. Now, again, why? Well, you know, they tried it, worked for them. So this is one of those things where, you know, there's no, no, no theory behind it. Now, the catch here, as in every also, this hierarchical algorithm, that when you, you know, after you build it, uh, you get this uh, complete linkage, exactly. Um, after you build this, uh, you, uh-oh, what did just happen? Do you guys still see my slides? No? Yes. Interesting. And how come I don't see them? <laughs> All right. Okay. It's back. Um, so, right. So when you got the tree structure, the question is always, um, you know, where to cut it? Because depending on where you cut it, you're going to get different number of, of communities. And, you know, again, in, in the paper, you know, the, the guys, they, you know, the, they did it, actually, um, this is bio, biological network, it's metabolic network for, for bacteria, and, and um, you know, they, I believe they did this, they cut it on, on certain levels based on their sort of, you know, external knowledge 
biological knowledge of sort of what you know what do you expect from clusters but this is a natural but you know in, in some sense since we're talking about uh you know modeling right you know algorithms should work for any type of network so that's what sort of it looks like and uh, you know it looks like pretty decent partitioning right now they don't do again in this type of algorithms it's you, you don't get the sort of here cluster here class you know here is community here's community here's community it's actually partitioning the entire graphs into groups right so you got here pretty much all of the nodes belongs to one of the communities right you don't have it like oh no these nodes are not part of any community they're not dense enough right so that's sort of um this this algorithm doesn't do it to you for you but again um, the point is, you know, there are algorithms that are very mathematical, like, you know, this linear algebra-based um, modularity optimization to a little bit more of, okay, yeah, we're going to optimize modularity because, um, but we're going to do it, um, you know, in this multi-resolution way with, um, you know, quite a hoc sort of greedy optimization procedure to this type of algorithm, which really doesn't really optimize sort of, you know, anything, but uh, tries to build out um, yeah, and, and sort of common sense dictates tells us that um, you know this should this this should work because it's kind of by, by construction right because every time you're kind of merging those that are closest to each other um, in fact you can probably I mean you can check definitely you can use modularity for example to you know check the results of this algorithm or you can use modularity um, to select where on this tree right where on this tree to cut right because you cut it here uh on the tree level or you know whatever here you cut it on the tree level it's symmetric matrix you get certain number of of communities you get certain modularity right you get here you get sort of fewer communities you get different modularity so you can actually use modularity score to select the optimal height of the tree on which you split it that's an option all right. Okay. Um, all right. Last one. Now, um, this is actually quite interesting, and um, um, the reason is the following: If you think about the problems you you often dealing with, you have this huge graph, and uh, very often you might not need to know the community structure everywhere. You might want to be able to detect community structure within the neighborhood of some nodes, right? Um, you know, investigating, I don't know, um, the, the phone call structure, you don't care about, you know, everybody is, uh, you know, friends, but what you care is, I don't know, you're trying to detect uh, so this organization, right? And so what you really want to see if the if their community is around certain, certain members exists. Um, and the entire graph is millions, actually like 15, 50 million, for example, node. If you think about, I don't know, MTS, like I think they even have 100, I don't remember how, how many, um, you know, how many clients they have, right? But um, it's very large graphs. And, and so you might want to work with, with a small part of it. Now you can cut it out, but if you cut it out, you kind of lose, uh, you know, the actual connectivity of, of some nodes. So it's gonna be interesting to have the sort of local algorithms that do not touch the entire graph um, when they detect they when, the, when those that only touch nodes that they need to touch to detect the community right and so one of the examples is of the step of algorithms here um, it's actually based on the random walks so the idea is the following um, you know imagine that you, you kind of model random walk on this graph um, then what's going to be happening is, um, you know, imagine that, you know, you start, you know, somewhere, somewhere here, right? And you're doing random walk. Well, from here you might get here, from here you might get here, from here you might get here, from here you might get here. From here, might get here. So you're going to be walking a long time before you actually hit this node that has an exit, uh, and it's even you hit that node one, two, three, four, five, six, there's one six chance that you, you still don't go there, right? So what I'm trying to say is, you know, random walks on graphs, they, they're usually trapped into those densely connected parts. 
Um, and, and in fact, uh, you know, if you use and look into the math, um, if you remember, we talked about like this quotient cuts, which um, calculates the ratio of the number of edges um, that leaves the node and stays within the group versus that leaves the node and goes sort of across the group. That's actually, you know, pretty much this quotient cut quotient, you know, that's number is, is directly connected to the chances of the random walk to leave that community. So, but this is quite intuitive, right? Um, so here is an algorithm that actually uses it. Uh, it's called the walk trap. Oh, and by the way, if you notice a lot of algorithms there sort of 2006, you know, 2002, four, five, six, 2010. So there was sort of a 10 years of active, active development of those type of algorithms. So here it's uh, consider random walk and graph. And we talked a lot about random walk. So it's just sort of uniform random walk uh, where you move uniformly at random. And the idea is the following. Now, uh, first we're gonna talk about how you can do it sort of in, in, in general and then there is practical implementation. So PIJ, the random walk matrix, right? Uh, is a probability of get from node I to J. If you put it to the power of T, so, you know, you, you apply it first time, second time, third time, et cetera. So iterating. That's actually probability to reach, go, get from node I to node J in T steps, all right? Okay, now mixing time is when, if, if and when you can reach the equilibrium. Okay, so the idea is the following. Um, if, if, two nodes are in the same community, then, um, you know, probability of reaching each other in some number, small number of steps is pretty high, right? If they're in different communities, it will take longer, more steps to reach. Now, if two nodes are in the same community, then if you start from some other node K, then the probability of you know, reaching in T steps node I from K and J from K is the same, or approximately the same, because they're in the same community, right? So there was a lot of connect connections, multiple ways of getting things, getting around. So that's what it is. So then we can try to come up with a metric of the distance between nodes. And the metric is the following. So you take that time, and you measure those probabilities, right? And you go through all the nodes K. Now, you can probably, if you notice, we try to come up with a distance metric between nodes. You know, you feel like you can have a different distance metric, you can try yours. All right. So what's next? Well, you kind of already kind of getting where it's going, right? We just define distance metrics between nodes. It's, uh, you know, we've done a you know, bunch of slides back, um, but over there we said distance metric between nodes will be based on the overlap, right? A number of sort of nearest neighbors. Here it's looking not at the nearest neighbors, but at random walk that starts at the node, right? And depending how far it can go, it just says, look, if you're in a community, you know, your random walk will be stuck within that community. So you'll be easily reaching sort of every node within that community. All right. So then the question is, you know, fine, there is this distance, how do you, but how do you actually compute it? Well, there are two ways. One way is to you actually take the matrix and put it in the, in the corresponding power, right? Um, you can do that. But if you do that, you know, you, you, you need to do matrix multiplication, which is not a cheap thing if you have a large matrix, right? So then it's not kind of a local algorithm. It's still, you're still dealing with the entire matrix. Uh, but then you can actually do very simple simulation because, you know, you can just start random walks, do a bunch of random work, walks uh, of, you know, particular length, and then approximate that, that probability by, you know, calculating how many times you reach the node divided by, how many random walks you did. And by the way, this is an uh, algorithm that is very easily parallelizable, right? You can run into multiple cores because you can do multiple random walks at the same time, right? 
and then you you know you estimate your your power your, your uh, the probability through this ratio and and then we do the same thing as we discussed previously okay now we want to you know if we try to merge nodes into the community we'll need to uh, define distance between communities and that's done you know as a weighted average here so it's also average distance um, as, as the same way as in the previous algorithm <clears throat> and then here's the algorithm it's also you know hierarchical agglomerative clustering but just with sort of this local feature so you don't really need to cluster all the nodes you can just deal with those and local here now notice what's really local means local means um you are dealing with the nodes and it and and their neighbors but local means you know you're following the edges right um so you know you assign each vertex to its own community you can, you can then you compute uh, distance between all adjacent communities um you know select and you compute the distance based on the random walk you know choose two closest communities um and then merge them right and just keep doing it so here is an example from 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 this guy's paper um how they do it um again going through the bunch of you know doing these computations merging for first pairs then triples you know then then you know get bigger and bigger so exactly the same kind of problem up towards uh, how do we split the, the how, where do we cut um you can also you know look here a little bit more in this random walks uh approaches or you can actually just do the modularity score also but the point is that this algorithm um has a little bit of sort of math mathematical flavor because it does look not just sort of at at the metric that came out of thin air but more uh, at this you know random walk and, and the random walk distance okay so that's kind of you know probably three four algorithms uh, on uh, you know i think we actually covered like five or six algorithms on, on you know graph partitioning and community detection there are really many 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 more of those algorithms exists and many more version of flavors exists um, so far that algorithm uh, um, that uh, you know multi-level community detection Louisville algorithm is probably the most popular and the most powerful um but you know maybe if somebody already came up with a with a you know better and more optimal one but that should give you like sort of the idea of what's out there now <clears throat> a couple more slides um, and i promised we're going to look at um the algorithms that will allow us to detect overlapping communities now when we when we look at the very first picture at the very first slide of today's lecture we um looked at the community that at, at, that two community that overlap on one person like for example it's you and that's your you know family versus work um, you know colleagues now it's very well possible that communities can overlap more than by more, with more than you know single node but it could be like say two nodes connected and so and so they overlap by an edge right or you can think of them like even overlapping even maybe by you know triangle or sort of um, any of those um, geometric structures so the question is can we detect those overlapping communities and uh, yeah this is sort of this the, the family sort of scientific friends schoolmates uh, picture um here is the idea uh, the algorithm is called k-click community detection and the idea is the following um, this type of scenario where we have overlapping communities and they overlap through a node or through an edge would happen when you have a quite dense graph right so when you have a sparse graph most likely you will be able to just cut it in the usual way but when you have a quite dense graph you might have situations um you know like like here right where it's you know cutting here is expensive cutting here is expensive you know, it's obviously like node f is an overlap um and maybe there is you know even even sort of more overlaps so what's the idea the idea is if these are dense graphs then let's detect first 
clicks, right? And we're going to decide which size of the click we're going to detect, right? You know, the click of size, you know, one is one node. The click of size two is just two nodes and an edge. Click of size three is triangle, right? Um, click of size two is just a line. Click of size three is triangle. Click of, you know, size four is this, etc. right? So we can decide what kind of structure we're going to detect. And then, uh, you know, our community will be determined as an overlap of, of those two, of, of those cliques. And, you know, to make some consistent judgment, we'll say that two K cliques are adjacent if they overlap by K minus one nodes, which means if you have a, a triangle, two triangles, right, which is a click of size three. They should overlap by a click of size you know, two, which is by two nodes. So, you know, when you have triangles, that should be um, the, the overlapping scenario, right? And when you have, um, you know, next step, right, click four, they should overlap by three nodes. So then it should be something like that. And so I have, there are three nodes in common. All right, okay. Okay, so the question is, uh, okay, so what, right? Well, here is the idea. Here is the idea. You know, let's, let's look at this, let's start with uh, you know this simple three, click, I mean the, the, the click size three, right? Here we have this click size three, and let's think about this kind of rolling it through the network. By rolling, I mean I mean you know we're going to expand it um, into other triangles or shift it into other triangles such that they have the common edge, right? For example, this A can become this guy B, right? So it kind of became, you know, this triangle, right? And then next step uh, would be, okay, you know, we, we, it's, we can take this, you know, this and this, and that's gonna be a new triangle, right? That overlaps with this guy by that edge. And then, you know, you can pick up this node and this is a triangle which overlaps with old one by you know that edge, et cetera, et cetera. Right now, if you do this, you realize that at some moment you cannot just do it anymore. Right, you run out of those triangles uh, that have an edge overlap, and then you're done. And then you start over again, you know, with another part of the graph. And if you do that, you 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 you, you can see. Oops, you can see how. Um, you know, you can see that you got this one community, you got this second community, right? Um, that has this sort of triangle situation, right? Triangles, and you got the third community with triangles. It's overlapping, right? Now, um, you can do it, but it's kind of pain in the ass, you know, try, trying to do it every time you need to detect you know, we want to detect one particular, uh, you know, click and then to propagate it through. So there is a much more efficient way of doing it. And here is an algorithm to do it. So first of all, you find all the maximal clicks, right? Remember, maximal click is a click that cannot be extended more. So uh, you want, you, if you have a, um, if you have, this structure, you don't want to kind, you don't want to count the triangle, which is a click. You don't want to count that one. You're actually looking, if it is part of the bigger click, you're looking at this bigger click, which is a maximal click, right? Okay, so you take those, you find all the maximal clicks and we looked at the algorithms. It's not very efficient. Actually, it's very inefficient to find them, but uh, you know, you find them. 
and then you create a click overlap matrix. Now, click overlap matrix is just you calculating how, on how many nodes those clicks overlaps. And then you threshold it at some value. And what you get, the communities will be, the connected components you get will be communities. Let me show you, uh, you know, what it means. Here's we done, you know, maximal clicks finding, right? Uh, and then uh, we have here, um, we have here one, two, three, four, five maximal clicks, right? The, the blue, red, green, pink, you know, yellow, brown clicks. They're of different sizes, but they're all maximal clicks. And then what we can do is we can calculate their overlap, right? So, you know, some of them overlap. And for example, um, you know, the, the red one overlaps with the blue one on three nodes, right? And that's what we put here. And, um, you know, brown overlaps with blue on this one node. And that's what we put here, All right? So we just count overlaps. And then we say, okay, now I'm gonna look for clicks of size four. Um, if I do clicks size four, remember my overlap should be at least three. You know, because we want to have, remember that continuous, so the overlap for the click we count how, you know, if it's click of size four, we need to have three nodes overlapping. If it's size three, we need to have two nodes overlapping, etc. So uh, we're looking for three. And so what we do is we just take this matrix and threshold it on three. So everything that above three remains, everything else goes. Uh, and, and that's your threshold. So these are the corners that are above three and then uh, there's somewhere else threes. Yeah, here's three and here's three. So yellow and blue overlaps uh, by three nodes. So that's what this three came from. All right, so we do that th thresholding. And then within this matrix, we're looking for connected components. The connected component is blue connected to red and connected to brown, right? And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, not connected to brown, connected to yellow, get this. And brown is not connected to anybody, it's just by itself. So which means if we look for four clicks, we get you know, this, this uh, community that consists only of brown and this community that consists of blue, red, and yellow, okay? That's an algorithm. Uh, Kind of nice, um, you know, it works. Uh, the challenge is, of course, the computational complexity, right? There are actually a lot of challenges here. Um, one is obviously the results will strongly depend on what, you know, what level of, um, what level or sort of what degree of, of uh, click you're looking for, right? You, you, you put K equal to 10 and you will not see a lot right, because those, uh, there are very few 10 clicks, you know, clicks of size 10, right, you put size k equal to three, it probably will connect, you know, give you the entire graph. So there is a sort of experimentation in terms of, okay, what number of, you know, clicks or what click size you use as a basis for this um, investigation. Um, you know, also, again, there's a parameter. This is a parameter that you need to tune up. You, you probably can use, you know, modularity score to do this. Um, but at least this gives you, actually modularity is not gonna go well here because modularity is designed for cutting, right? And here we, we, we don't cut um, the edges. So, you know, I'm not sure if modularity will help you with this one. Um, you know, the authors recommend, you know, trying multiple case and see what works, right? Okay, so that was sort of overall picture. A couple more uh, comments. You know, when you deal with real graphs, large graphs, they're mostly sparse, right? And that's why this first method, I mean, first class of methods, they, you know, they much more developed and much more applicable than the second class, but still there are some situations when you do want to have an overlapping graphs overlapping communities, 
Um, you know, there is, there has been quite a lot of experimental work and this work done by uh, Kevin Lang and Jura Liskovic um, from Stanford and Yahoo. And they looked at a bunch of, uh, you know, graphs that are out there. And they just looked, uh, you know, at, at overall the, the, the communities in those graphs. Um, and what they're saying is that majority of those graphs, they do kind of consist of this large core, and then there's a sort of whiskers or you know, small uh, communities hanging out there. And what they're saying is that uh, if you measure the conductance, and remember the conductance, again, this is the ratio of the cut divided by the total number, by the minimum of the volume, right? That sort of conductance, again, um, uh, you know, tells us, as we just saw a few minutes ago, um, that it is connected to the probability of, of random walk to escape from the cluster, right? So it sort of gives us the notion of, you know, of, of quality of the partitioning, right? And um, if the conductance is small, then, you know, you, you, you have good partitioning. And what they notice is, uh, you know, they, they measure this conductance for different levels of partitioning uh, and you know the different size of the nodes in the in, in in the in the cluster, right? So they just looked at the very small clusters, at the larger clusters, larger clusters, larger, and just measured you know over overall conductance for the network, um, average conductance. And what they realized that uh, in fact, you know, and I think I I don't remember precisely, but I believe somewhere here where they have minimum, this is a couple hundred nodes, right? So when you reach so when you reach clusters of couple hundred nodes in real world graphs, this is sort of the optimal size, which means, you know, most of the clusters or communities there are of that size. Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, you, when, you, when you try to build communities or detect communities larger, that conductance overall is dropping, which means, uh, you know, you don't get nice cuts anymore, right? Um, now, this is, of course, you know, you know, some communities can be very large, but typically that what you see, and it, what you know, the, their their hypothesis was that, uh, you know, what you what you see is that, you know, you kind of when you reach the size couple hundred, it's kind of the moment when you cut out when you're done with sort of cutting out this type of communities, right? That are what they call whiskers, and then you start cutting into this core of the graph which is actually very well connected and there is no, it just, just doesn't have good cuts in, in it, right? And that's why this conductance is growing. But this is sort of overall observation on the social networks. It's not sort of generically true. This is the networks that are more coming from the social uh, you know, systems from like, like Facebook or Twitter, et cetera. Okay, sort of one last point is that, uh, <laughs> This review is now 10 years old, right? Uh, wow, it's 10 years old. Uh, even 10 years ago, there was, and these were not all the methods, right? But there's like a bunch of papers and methods that were out there. And, uh, you know, N is a number of nodes, M is a number of edges in the graph. You know, graphs are sparse. We typically deal with a spark graph. So N is, I'm sorry, M is in, in the order of magnitude of N. You know, you get approximately the same number of, of nodes, I mean, edges as nodes, if you have a sparse graph of the same order of magnitude. But so you can, you know, everywhere you can see it, at, you know, you can replace M by N. But the point is, like lots of those algorithms, if you try to, 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 to run them on uh, you know large graphs, they're useless, right? I mean, you know, this is not going to work, right? On a large graph, this is not going to work on the right graph. Um, just most of them do not work on the large graph. Now, this one is this overlapping communities. This is just you know, it, it's sort of it's good on a small graph, but it's disaster on, on a bigger graph, right? And the reason is you know, detecting those. Um, groups, right? So, I mean, pretty much what you end up with is there are several algorithms that are linear, right? Um, and then there is sort of, okay, here is n log squared n, all right. Um, you know, this is interesting. Um, and of course, this one, right? And this is as fast 
partitioning, right? This Blondo, you know, Luvian method. It's it's the only one with that computational complexity. There. Okay, I'm lying. There is another one. Um, we haven't talked about it, uh, but that that actually comes. This algorithm InfoMap it actually uses um, the coding theory, um, trying to think about graphs and graph partitioning as um, you know, transmission problem and uh, finding the optimal code um, that, allows you, that allows you to compress the graph. So, so pretty much for them, graph partitioning goes through graph compression and compression is expressed through the coding problem. So you're find, trying to find the optimal combination such that you can sort of send the graph with a minimum amount of information. And that means, you know, if you find those nodes that belong to the same community, that they, you know, you need less information to describe the graph because you then describe community instead of separate nodes. Um, but other than that, uh, the, the computational complexity is like a killer here. And if you think about graphs of millions of nodes, it's, you know, it's very clear that your options are either sort of this, this algorithm, you know, the, the blonde algorithm, or maybe those, you know, sort of random walk like local algorithms that, uh, you know, allows you not to touch the entire graph. Um, that's pretty much it with graph partitioning. Um, I think we're done here. Um, then um, the rest of the lectures we're going to cover, actually before I go there, um, any questions? So is there exist uh, some uh, standard, uh, maybe artificial uh, graphs where we can estimate and test uh, our cluster algorithm like in standard uh, clustering problem? Yeah, very good question. And I forgot, um, you know, I didn't put it in the slides. Um, there, are, there are several benchmarks, like there are several artificial benchmarks, um, the newman gearman benchmark and there are a couple more. Um, if you look in the book Barabashi Albert, Barabashi, I mean Barabashi book on of network science, um, there is, I think there is, you know, part of the chapter is dedicated to those, uh, you know, standardized um, tests, right? And some algorithm perform better, some worse on those. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, with those, uh, you know, benchmark, the only thing is it, because, you know, a lot of those algorithms, they are sort of empirical and heuristic. The only thing that benchmark shows that the algorithm performs that well on that benchmark. So in some sense, it's, it's, it's very hard to extrapolate the, you know, the, the, the numbers you get on benchmark to the real networks because you know benchmark is based a uh, build on certain properties like for example you try to build a benchmark for power law networks right so you force the distribution of nodes to be certain way right or you force it to be like have certain number of clusters or certain size of the clusters but in any case yes there are benchmarks um there are standard benchmarks and you can run uh you know against them and there are benchmarks in terms of like you know actual generated graphs and then there are the benchmarks in terms of like generative schemes, like the processes you can generate graph of, you know, any size you want or, you know, any so, or, or certain type of properties. Okay. So the answer is yes, you can compare it. So it seems like uh, research in this uh, problem like stopped in uh, uh, 20, 10 years. I mean, uh, is there exist a uh, new something? Actually, actually, it's, it's, it's more of like, uh, I stopped uh, following it closely in, in, in you know, 2010 uh, on that, well, maybe not 2010, but a little bit later. But let me see, the Barabashi Albert book is published in 2016. I don't know, I mean, you guys seen that. I mean, well, you have seen the book, it's online, right? Um, yeah, this book is published in 2016. I I think, I believe, uh, all the methods that are in the book we covered, I, I think when we didn't cover this InfoMap. So there could be some more methods coming along, but, um, you know, not at this moment. I mean, look, the, the you know, science and, and research, they, they go in waves. Things become popular. You start writing these papers. You, you, they get accepted. More 
people writing it, more people reading them, and you know, it reaches a certain level, then you realize, okay, there is nothing new and exciting, and you know, interest drops. The same happened with deep learning, right? It's kind of going crazy, then it's kind of slowing down. Now I'm pretty sure you, next year you will see tons and tons of papers on virus propagation on networks, right? Uh, obvious reason. So, uh, you know, it comes and goes. Um, take a look. I mean, this Fortunato to 10, this is a review, uh, like 100 pages long review uh, on, on uh, you know, on algorithms. I'm pretty sure they were more recent, but if I think about sort of recent topics that people talk about in networks, it's more about network embeddings, right? It's a sort of connection or like neural or deep learning uh, you know, network um, networks or connection networks with you know, neural networks, um, those kind of things. And then if, for example, if you, if you, if you learn good embedding, right, which means assigning coordinates and putting your graph into low dimensional space, then for example, graph partitioning means you, know, you hopefully embed it such a way that the, the nodes that are connected, tightly connected, in this embedding, they're next to each other. And then graph partitioning becomes you know, clustering problem. In fact, we almost did this with a spectral graph partitioning, right? We uh, you know, found an embedding into one dimensional space in one eigenvector. But if you embed it into a three, that's your graph embedding. It's just back in you know, 1970 and back in you know, late 90s, when people did those uh, algorithms, they never talked about it as embedding. And now, you know, with, with deep learning, people talking about, you know, embedding. So, um, yeah, take a look. There might be something better, but honestly, I kind of doubt, honestly, I kind of doubt that, that you can do better than this because M is a number of edges. And literally what it says, you need to touch every edge at least once. But look, if you want to find communities, you need to, trace the edges right because you know edges is what tells you about communities so you need to touch an edge at least once and that's why there is this o of m i'm actually even surprised it's not o of m plus n but it's o of m um and so i doubt you can do better than that you can probably you know do the same um complexity but maybe better quality that's possible have a question yeah uh, will we consider uh, the algorithm for embedding graph? Uh, I think we will. On one of the like sort of later lectures, we'll look into this graph neural networks topics. All right. One last thing is, I think uh, you know we 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 scheduled on Saturdays. I think uh, with the holidays, um, though. Uh, high school of economics, you know, I think they canceled like spring vacation, right? Spring break. Uh, but we still get onto those holidays, right? So we don't have a lecture next week. The week after, I kind of don't know. I haven't seen the, I haven't looked at the calendar, what sort of the official dates. But next week, it's definitely like what, first of May or? Um, or 2nd of May, right? That's definitely a holiday. All right. Okay. Good. So if no more questions,